You're about to listen to a BBC podcast, and, and trust me, you'll get there in a moment. But if you're a comedy fan, I'd really like to tell you a bit about what we do. I'm Julia McKenzie, and I commission comedy podcasts at the BBC. It's a bit of a dream job, really. Comedy is a fantastic, joyous thing to do because really you're making people laugh, making people's days a bit better, helping them process all manner of things. But, you know, I also know that comedy is really subjective and everyone has different tastes. So we've got a huge range of comedy on offer from satire to silly, shocking to soothing, profound to just general prattling about. So if you fancy a laugh, find your next comedy at BBC Sounds. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Hello and welcome to the Scottish Football Podcast, your one-stop shop for all the latest news, analysis and gossip about the beautiful game in this country. Thursday the 23rd of November, I'm Liam McLeod. And coming up today, returning to the dugout... If you offered me ninth, I'd love to finish higher than that. If you offered me ninth right now, of course I would take it. We're joined by manager of many clubs, Ian McCall, to discuss, amongst other things, taking over at Clyde. Also, Chalmers is the first man back. He takes over. Happy to cross, sends it into the path of McCann. And he scores! Could we be in for Derby drama in Dunfermline? We preview the Scottish Cup third round tie between the Pars and Wraith Rovers. And... You know, it's definitely... Possibilities. There's possibilities there, you know. I, I did hit the ball quite a lot. Should the effects of heading a football be classed as an industrial injury? We discuss after Scotland legend Alec McLeish backed a campaign on the issue. This is the Scottish Football Podcast from BBC Sport Scotland. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, I'm joined by Ian McCall, the Clyde manager. Ian, you're back in at the deep end. What's your what's your thought process in returning to the game and returning to Clyde? Clearly, it's a big job in your hands you've got there. Uh, yeah, well, my, my thought process was, yes, it's it's going to be a real challenge, but one of my main thinkings was, you know, when I was coming through in the, in the very, very early 80s uh, as a player, I mean, Clyde... Kind of represented something. They were, they, they were. You guys are maybe a bit young for that, but they were a, a club uh, to be reckoned with, and you know they were a, a similar community like club to to Morton, that type of club. You know, the one of our greats, Craigie Brown, who they had a thing for last uh, Saturday, actually, and a lot of the we Pat Nevin was there. A lot of the former Clyde players were there, so. You know, I, I I just didn't want to see a club like that fall out the leagues. I'm not saying I'll be able to keep them there, but um, I, I didn't think because if you do fall into low and league Liam these days because of the the change in culture around football, there's an awful lot of clubs spending money in the lower leagues, in the lowland league, highland league, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then you tend to not come back. Case in point, your East Stirlings, uh, Albion Rovers. Bear it, all the teams that I was playing against as a boy in the 80s, so mm-hmm. uh, when I was coming through, so that was my main thing. I don't want to see them falling out of the league. I think future wise, they need, they need to find a home and they're, they're pretty proactive in that. Hopefully, that happens. I think that's way more important, important than who they appoint as manager. Um, it's a big job. Let's hope we can do it. Lots more to come from Ian shortly. We'll also hear from Craig Brewster and Wraith Rovers fan Alan Russell. But before that, let's take a quick spin through today's Scottish football news. The Celtic chairman Peter Lawwell has told the club's annual general meeting that despite a pre-tax profit of £40.7 million, the financial gap with Europe's top clubs is getting bigger. As we'll discuss shortly, Alec McLeish has backed calls for the effects of heading a football to be classed as an industrial injury. The Scotland women's team, who are currently bottom of their Nations League table, have Bayern Munich Sam Kerr back in the squad for their final group games against Belgium and England. In the SWPL, Glasgow City moved to within seven points of second placed Celtic with a 1-0 win over Montrose last night. And ahead of his return to Tynecastle this weekend, new St Johnston manager and Hearts legend Craig Levine has said he hopes he gets booed by the home fans. Something I'm sure, Ian, you've never experienced? Oh, I've experienced it. Don't you worry about that. I remember (laughs) going back with uh, Party Thistle to Somerset. I mean, I'd left them at the top of the championship and we nearly went into League Two when I arrived. 
um, but it did not stop them giving me absolute pelters. Um, I don't think I'd get pelters going back to Fur Hill, mind you, but yeah, I know. I know Craig's thinking, and he'll be he'll be delighted if they do boo him as long as they win. We will get back to the Scottish Cup and Ian's Clyde his ambitions for the team for the rest of the season just shortly. But a couple of the other Scottish football news stories that are kicking around today. Firstly, Alec McLeish backing calls for the effects of heading a football to be classed as an industrial injury. It's something that's that's gone on. It's been discussed quite a lot in, in recent times. And, and Alec name check the likes of Billy McNeil and Gordon McQueen, Jeff Astle uh, yesterday talking about this. Ian and and clearly you played in, in a similar era to to Big Alec. And the one thing I remember, you know, watching Aberdeen as a youngster was just this big shock of red hair winning header after header after header. Is this something that's in your in your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's been it's pretty prevalent now when you speak to players from that generation of a certain type. I mean, I, I didn't really head the ball very, very often, you know, but <laughs> uh, I, I get your point about Alec. And I think he said something like it's, it was his job. And, and that's that's true. And it's still till this day. But you do get players um, from that area that are becoming increasingly, well, even centre forwards. I know what I, I know. McCoy is, is worried about it. Who who headed the ball quite a lot over their career, and I think you know they do say about the weight of the ball, but I I, I don't think that's as relevant to. I think it's just the amount of of contact. And in those days, you know, Alec must have headed the ball. I don't know how many times he headed the ball, but you're talking about who's doing it in training. We've changed training a little bit now. Does it go far enough? Do you think? Well, do you know it's really, really hard. I mean, it, it's such an important part. It of is the game, absolutely, it? As, as, as and a it's sport. a skill. There used to be a there was a centre yeah. forward that played at Dumbarton called John Burke, and he played at Kilmarnock, and he he, he was the best in the air I ever saw. He, he could pass the ball with his head. It was it, it was it's an art form like defending is like beating a man is, um, but yeah, I mean, at Fridays, you know, when when the rule came in, we stopped it definitely. And when you do sit, most clubs, I would say, do shape and set plays and things on a Friday. And usually we wouldn't have, we weren't having people heading the ball anyway. But it's a very, very hard thing to do when somebody is of a competitive nature, i.e. Alan McLeish, because there are players like that around just now. I'm not saying of his stature, but of similar type, who in training on a Friday, if the ball's up there, it's so, so hard for them not to go and head it. And I think... To take it any further, we may have to take it further, but it would be very, very hard, very difficult to do. And you, even when you're doing cross and finishing and drills, you know, many times if you commentated in the game when the ball's been played in, somebody's running and attacking it, well, that's what you try and work at in training sometimes, you know, even a, 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 a back post run or a getting across the front. So it's a really, really tough ask to do that, but it may have to be done because there are certainly far more players from that era you know, getting worried about it. And that's because of the instances you just quoted there. Yeah, bbc.co.uk slash sports Scotland. You can read what Alec McLeish has been saying about it. And clearly it's going to be something that will will run. Also in the news, the Celtic AGM, one of the big headlines to come out of it was Peter Lawwell, the club's chairman, saying the financial gap with the top European teams is getting bigger. Ian, that clearly feel, you know, in that when you hear that and you see that sentence, they clearly feel that they are struggling uh, to compete at Champions League level just now. You know, you won't get too many of uh, the other clubs in Scotland shedding a tear. No, I don't think so. Given the dominance that Celtic have had over the last, uh, particularly over the last decade, but in the last quarter of a century, really they've they've uh, fought back. Um, is, is it is it down to finances? Is it purely down to finances? Because you've seen some of the, the clubs who spent unbelievable amounts of money. Think of Manchester United, for example, languishing at the bottom of their Champions League group. It's not just down to finance, is it? Or is it? No, I, no. listen, I don't think it is. I genuinely don't think it is. But, I mean, if the difference in finance is like our Scottish Premier League, like uh, Motherwell going to Celtic Park, that difference in finance is... It's just huge, utterly huge. I mean, I get that the bigger clubs, certainly in Euro com European competition, are, are, are moving a bit further away. I think that's why the Super League was was broached and, and shot down, although I still think there's the embers of that burning somewhere. 
Uh, oh, next season's Champions League's effect. Well, yeah, well, that's what it's turning into. Really, I mean, league phase. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but the only thing I'll say about that is I don't think it excuses um, Celtic from from competing against certain clubs. I mean, that you get to the last eight of, I think most people would give you ten clubs that will be in the last eight of the Champions League. I think that's pretty easy to predict now. But certainly from the group stages, I think certainly against the likes of Feyenoord, you saw what Copenhagen did against uh, Manchester United. I know Manchester United going through a hard time, but you should certainly be able to compete at that level. But I think if the argument is Celtic are financially more equipped to play in the Europa League and to win it than the Champions League, I think that's a no-brainer. Of course it is. That may be what they're about. You know, the riches on offer from the Champions League, That's got, they've got to actually... They've still got to try and qualify. They've still got to pin it to make sure they can. But I don't think if they're wanting, if Celtic fans are wanting, you know, Brendan and Peter Lobel to go and splash 15, 20, 25 million on a player, I don't I, I don't think that will happen. Well, as you know, that won't happen. But you're right, there will be a lot of people within Scottish football, within our game, having a chuckle at those remarks because of what they face every single week. You're listening to the Scottish Football Podcast. Our attention does, of course, turn very soon to this weekend's Scottish Cup third round. Lots of big games to look forward to. Probably the tie of the round, I would suggest, is the Fife Derby, Dunfermline Athletic against Wraith Rovers. That's our live TV game on the BBC Scotland television channel tomorrow. We'll discuss it with uh, Ian as well, a former Dunfermline player, of course, and Wraith fan Alan Russell of Supporters Direct Scotland in just a moment. But first, here's the thoughts of Craig Brewster. Remember him? Played for both clubs. As a player, being involved in derbies is uh, what it's all about. And I was fortunate enough to play in a, a Dundee, Edinburgh and the Fife derby. So I can imagine a full house. They'll be there, both sets of fans really up for it. And that's what gets the players going. And when you're on the winning side of a derby, there's nothing better than that feeling and uh, gloating after the game and, and the fans going to work the following day, being able to say we were the best team. When I came back from Greece, I played with Ian Murray, the Wraith manager, and he was a real competitor in his time as a player. Defender, strong, aggressive and I'm sure uh, that's what he's making his team like. They're doing really well in the league. There's four points behind Dundee United with a game in hand, so they're really strong. Dunfermline, they're a real good team. They're exciting to watch. Have they got enough goals in their team? Well, it, it'll depend on the night. This is the Scottish Football Podcast. Alan, welcome to the Scottish Football Podcast. Good to have you with us. Are you going to the game? Are you excited? Yes, I am, Lane. I'm um, going and very excited. Uh, you know, Derby games are brilliant. We, we missed out on them for quite a few seasons. Uh, and it's great to have them back uh, in the league, in the cup, and pretty much in every cup this season. Yeah, you've been spoiled this campaign. This is the fourth one of the season. They've all been pretty tight, haven't they? There was a 1-1 draw in the League Cup in Kirkcaldy, uh, which uh, obviously Dunfermline managed to take a bonus point from. And then the two league games, which were... I suppose, infinitely more important in the ambitions of Wraith Rovers and Dunfermline. Uh, and you guys won both of them narrowly. Sam Stanton has turned into a bit of a goal machine in that fixture, is he not? Yeah, he's the partial there now. Um, we just want Sam Stanton on the park every match, but particularly against Dunfermline, <laughs> because he seems to, to really rise to, to those occasions. Yeah, I mean, the atmosphere at these games is, is generally pretty good. I, I look back at the highlights of the games, the league matches that we're talking about there, and they're both so tight. And if it hadn't been for your keeper, Kevin Dabrowski, in the, the, the game, but in particular at Starks Park, uh, it might well have been a, a very different outcome. They could have gone either way, which suggests that this tie could be on a knife edge as well. Yeah, I mean, that last one at Starks Park, it was, it was quite hard to watch as a Rover supporter because I think most of us will admit that Dunfermline were the better team for most of that game. Uh, Kevin kept us in it with some brilliant saves. But it, it, the longer that match went on in the second half, we seemed to 
maybe not get stronger, but we stayed really, really strong as Dunfermline started to tire a little bit. And that's been, the, I think, probably the biggest feature of our, of our performances this season is that we, we keep on going right till the, the bitter end. You know, the number of last minute winners that we've had is unbelievable, really. And you can't leave a match early uh, when Rovers are playing this season because they, they keep on going right until the end. Doesn't matter how many minutes of injury time we get added on, we'll still be competing and, and still be just as strong as we are in the first minute. And that's, that's brilliant to see because winning big matches is great. Uh, playing spectacular the football is great but when you're just consistently so solid you know that just gives you real confidence and and keeps you going when when things maybe aren't going going your way on the pitch scoring loads of last minute winners Ian the sign of champions is it not yeah they're, listen they've signed a lot of good players Ray Throvers I think uh, Dunferman am I right in saying call them the wee team is that would that be? I think that's correct. Um, well, I listen, they've got two uh, relatively young managers. Well, every manager's young compared to me who both came through difficult situations and have, have, are excelling now. One, you know, James, who arguably was harshly treated at Dundee and he's done very well there. I do like to look at how Ian Murray set his teams up really well uh, for Airdrie. Actually, according to Ian, they should have beat us about three or four times, but we beat them every time. But anyway, that's just an aside. I, yeah, they've got a lot of good footballers. They signed well. They signed very early. I think they got their squad together quite early. Still think they look quite light in bodies, um, numbers-wise, uh, Ray, for a for a league title campaign. But I think they're certainly good enough to to challenge Dundee United. But anyway, the BBC has got a cracking cup tie uh, tomorrow night. I think the atmosphere will be under the lights of East End will be crackling. Alan, these are, are ties to really relish, aren't they? Just finally, uh, right in front of the... TV cameras under the lights at East End Park. I mean, it can really set the tone for the rest of the season as well. And Dunfermline have had, they're, they're in nowhere near as good form as Wraith right now. So you guys probably go into this one as favourites, despite the fact it's away from home, albeit only 12 miles away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably the bookies will have us as, as, as quite strong favourites just because we are where we are in the league. But you never get an easy match in the, in the derby. Um, even the ones that finish you know, 4-1 in one direction or 4-1 in the others, there's always moments in the games where you think this could go either way. Um, and I think that's why people keep on going. I mean, they, the, the high indication, um, there's, there's, there always seems to be more at stake when it's your rival. But they're also two very, very good football teams that are good to watch. And um, when you put them against each other, you know, it, they're, they're generally very, very good matches. We were talking about the Wraith Dunfermline Scottish Cup tie a moment ago. Ian and Clyde are in Scottish Cup action against Genefield Swifts tomorrow. That's on Friday night as well. Um, some of the other ties. I mean, Ian, there's there's some crackers, isn't there? Partick Thistle, Queen's Park, the All League One clash between Hamilton, Kelty, Hearts, Dundee United go to Queen of the South, who are under big pressure just now. Um, United looking to bounce back from their first defeat in 17 at in the Challenge Cup at Falkirk last week. But for you guys, Ian Genefield Swift, what a what a result they had in uh, round two, um, putting Elgin City to the sword six nothing. It's going to be a a big challenge. And again, it it just underlines as you were hinting about earlier on the gap between the SPFL clubs in the lower reaches and those in the Lowland League and even further beyond that. Is narrowing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you, you get a, a 50, 60 year old supporter picking up a paper today and looking at Clyde are playing at home to Gene Field Swifts. They'll just think for certain Clyde will win, and it's not, you know, it's genuinely not not like that. You know, we've not been able to see them, we've not been able to get any clips, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But listen, that Gene Field Swifts were 5 nothing up at half time against the team that are above us in the league. So I don't think we will have to ward off any complacency because I don't think there's any chance of the players being there because of that single result. I mean, I've looked at their league table, their league results have been very good. They seem to score a lot of goals. We've got one little report on them. So listen, they're, they're under no illusions how hard it'll be. It'll be a very, very hard cup tie, one that we want to win, but it'll be tough. Well, listen, we wish you, Ian, well uh, for the rest of the season, not just in the Scottish Cup tie. And good luck to all the clubs taking part in the Scottish Cup third round this weekend on Fernand Wraith, as I say, live on Sports Scene on the BBC Scotland channel Friday night from half seven. I'll keep you up to date as we go along in that game with how Ian's team's getting on against the Perth side. It's going to be quite the game, Ian. What's your main ambition, finally, on the podcast today for, for Clyde for the, the season? Is it simply 
finishing ninth and then hopefully kicking on after that. Right now it is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if we just have to maintain Clyde's league status and uh, that will be difficult. But, you know, we've got the January window coming. Everybody's got a fresh start. We need to try and pick up one or two results before then. Won't be easy. But yeah, I mean, if you if you offered me ninth, I'd love to finish higher than that. If you offered me ninth right now, of course I would take it. Ian McCall, thank you for joining us on the Scottish Football Podcast today. And thank you for listening. Tom English and Amy Canavan will be with you tomorrow. And remember, if you've got any comments or questions, send them into our new email address, scottishfootball at bbc.co.uk. That's scottishfootball at bbc.co.uk. And you can get us wherever you get your podcast. So if you haven't done so already, just search for the Scottish Football Podcast and hit subscribe and keep up to date at the website bbc.co.uk slash sports Scotland. Sports scene Friday night and you've got sports sound across the weekend with all the league and Scottish Cup action. For now, bye-bye. A reminder, Behind the Goals with me, Rachel Corsey and Leanne Crichton is now available every Tuesday. Make sure you tune in every week for all things women's football and plenty of special guests. Just search Behind the Goals on BBC Sounds.